Get info. Hi, my name is Heshi Rubinstein of the Yisker Foundation. For the past 20 years, the Yisker Foundation have been collecting interviews and testimonies of Holocaust survivors, men and women. So many different stories, so many different stories we, that we hear from every survivor. Their suffering and their miracles of surviving. As even all over the world, keep this day Tishabuf for mourning the destruction of Jerusalem and our holy temple. We pray and hope that this day will become a Yom Tov when Mashiach comes. This day, in so many Jewish communities around the world, they invite Holocaust survivors for speaking engagements, whether it's in a shul, whether it's in a yeshiva or a school, so that on this day of Tishabov, it is when I think they find it suitable to hear the testimony of Holocaust survivors, to hear their horrors, the atrocities, the brutal murders and tortures of the Jews by the German Nazis and the SS. Just because, just because they were born as Jews. I do have to mention a special thanks to my wife that she encourages me always and she even accompanies me as we go to interview survivors and she knows that this is a very important mission that we're on and as most of the holidays, for example, Sukkot or Pesach, we spend in Florida with friends and family. The intermediate days of Yantav, like Hanamoid, many people go to the aquarium, to a circus, to the monkey jungle, to the parrot jungle. We go visit Holocaust survivors. We search and we find out where we can find and meet a Holocaust survivor. And we drive for hours to meet Holocaust survivors. And this is what we do on Chalamoid. This is our Chalamoid. This past Yom Tov, as we visited, and we stayed in Florida, I found out about a very special Holocaust survivor. And yes, every Holocaust survivor is very special. So I did travel and we drove a while and we met Holocaust survivor, Mr. Norman Fragman. You will see, as you see in the uh, video, he still has his Holocaust uniform. It was such a pleasure meeting this Mr. Norman. He remembers the Yiddishkeit in Warsaw. He was born in Warsaw. He was raised in Warsaw. His parents had, back in Warsaw, can you imagine, before World War II, they had a transportation company, meaning they had trucks and they had horses and wagons and there was like a trucking company. It was really, really zis and geschmack to hear how he described Yiddish life in Warsaw before the war. He remembers so clearly, clearly his Yiddish upbringing. He even spoke, you'll hear in the interview, he spoke a few words in Yiddish. And he said something that he grew up speaking Polish, not speaking Yiddish because he was in the, uh, in the city of Warsaw. And when his parents wanted to speak something secretive, they used the Yiddish language. So he didn't meet, he didn't really grow up speaking Yiddish. But one thing he mentioned to me, that because in the ghetto and in the lagers after that, so many Yidin from different cities and different shtetls were gathered together. They spoke Yiddish because that was their first language. And in the lagers, in the concentration camps, that's where he learned a lot Yiddish. You will hear him speaking Yiddish. 
and very, very cute. He was only 10 years old when the war started. His beautiful life was, I guess, cut short when he was only 10 years old, and that's when his Sora started. He remembers and he describes clearly the precious information of the start of the Warsaw Ghetto, which I'm sure most of um, the people heard of the Warsaw Ghetto, the horrors of the life in the ghetto. He remembers the name of the person that started, that said, Dayenu, enough is enough, and started the uprising in the Warsaw, Warsaw Ghetto, I'm sure, and I hope most of you know and heard and know about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So he continues on and he goes on, well, I'm not going to give you his entire interview because we want you to watch the interview. So, but he also was in the very, very infamous, horrible camp Majdanek. It's a Shrek to hear what he describes Majdanek as. And of course, he talks about the Arzurius, the brutality of the German Nazis during the Death March. He was in the Death March, of course. He describes when people were being deported and transported in cattle cars, I hope, and I'm sure that most of you know what cattle cars are and how, how it was, how horrible it was when 120 people, between 100 and 120 people were cramped and stuffed into a cattle car. You couldn't sit, you couldn't stand, and there was no air. There was just a tiny window, and he describes the cattle cars as well. Of course, we all know what selectia means, selection where the Yamach Shemoy decided who will live and who will die. His father was taken to a forced labor camp and he survived the war. His mother and his young sister, unfortunately, when it came to that selection, he was sent to the right. His mother and his little sister were sent to the left. And that was the last time he saw them. They were gassed and cremated, murdered by the Nazis, the Mahshama. I will have to mention special thanks to my son Yossi. Yossi is also very involved with me in this project. As he travels to many parts of the world, I travel to many parts of the world, not always together. But we do this as a mission because it has to be done. And we've been doing it for the past 20 years. Now at the end, I would like to thank Yid Info. Yid Info for broadcasting this interview today on Tisha B'Av. Thank you very much. I cannot say sit down and enjoy the show. This is not something to enjoy. But I think it's the perfect timing on Tisha B'Av. We're fasting. We all went to synagogue last night and this morning to say Aichu and the Kinnis. Now for the rest of the day as we're fasting, I think it is an important project to watch or to listen or to visit any Holocaust survivor and to know what happened by the Chorben Ayerapa. Now we're mourning Chorben Habayis, Chorben Beis Hamikdash. It is also appropriate to mourn and to remember Chorben Ayerapa. Thank you very much. Have an easy fast. My name is Heshi Rubenstein from the Yisker Foundation. We will be interviewing Mr. Norman Freiman. Fragman. Fragman. Mr. Norman Fragman. 
today living in Boynton Beach, Florida. Today is October 13, 2022. Our purpose for doing this is to educate our future generations. The Holocaust and the suffering of the Jewish people during World War II should never be forgotten. Never forget. That is our name, the Yisker Foundation. Just like Mr. Norman is always going around lecturing in schools and organizations and so forth, for the same purpose is what we are doing to further the education about the Holocaust. Good afternoon, Mr. Norman. Good afternoon to you, Arshi. Thank you. You came to me at the beginning. I just kind of didn't want to be interviewed because I don't know. But once I found, I got the assurance that it is not going to be commercialized. Then I consented. Meaning it's not going to be commercialized. As I explained, this is to further the education of the Holocaust, whether we should publish it or... As long as there is no financial renovation for it, I'm with it. So please state your name. My name is Norman Fragman. At home in Poland, my, the name was Fryman. All of a sudden, I became a Fragman, and this is who I am. Where are you from? I'm from Warsaw, Poland. Yes. And I, my name is Nochem Ben Yehuda Arya. And what was your mother's name? Who this? In Poland, they called the Hela, H-E-L-A. And I also had a sister who was 18 months younger than I. And the name was Renia, Rene. Unfortunately, they were taken to somebody at the young age. They were... Margaret and Mardonic. So how many children were you at home? Two. Just you and your sister. sister. Yeah. What was your mother's maiden name? My mother's maiden name was T R Y S K. Trisk. And the Trisk family in Warsaw at my grandfather. Uh, Shmuel Trisk, I think there were seven brothers and a sister. And uh, on the other side, for my paternal, we also heard that my grandparents lived in Palestine. They went to Palestine in 1929. And then the seven children, they took three with them, lived in Tel Aviv. And uh, the rest, of course, uh, lived in Poland, and uh, what has happened, they came in in 1938 to visit the four children they left here, and uh, they got stuck, and uh, unfortunately they also were killed. My grandmother, Yehudas Ryman, my grandfather Yeshaya, my grandmother was is the only one that died of natural deaths in the ghetto. She had diabetes, and she's the only one that is buried properly the Jewish way. And she's buried in the Warsaw Synagogue, a Warsaw Cemetery. But the rest, not. What did your father do for a living in Warsaw? My whole family was on the transportation. What we had is horse and wagons and trucks. And we distributed a lot of stuff that came from outside of Warsaw, primarily flour for bakeries uh, that came by railroad. We unloaded it and distributed it to individual places. And then also marble to make uh, had stalls and all that. A heavy thing also was the special house of our, uh, my parents' company. 
So your father had trucks back in Warsaw. Trucks and horse and wagons. Yeah. What can you tell me of Jewish life before the war in Warsaw? Well, I can tell you one thing about my maternal grandparents. They kept up a stable not too far from us. And of course, the when they gathered a gabai there and a uh, uh, stable, you know, that they had the Torah and uh, they were very charitable. I, the picture of my grandmother is to sit in the rocking chair with the with the siddur in her hands, constantly praying. Yes, and I would consider them really modern Orthodox. They, uh, I don't know, my grandmother probably wore a shaitel, and what my grandfather did not have parents, and uh, well, whatever went with it. Do you remember which synagogue your father and you went to in Warsaw? Uh, sometimes we used to go to the synagogue on Klomatska Street, which was one of the largest synagogues, I believe, in Europe. And many times we went to the stable that was kept up by my grandfather. I'm sure this is a common number. How many... Jews lived in Warsaw? Well, I'm not quite sure, but I think upward of 300,000. So as a child, you grew up in Warsaw. Where did you go to school? I went to a school that taught Hebrew, not the Heider. It was not the Yeshiva. It was a school that Hebrew was taught there with the uh, future date for me to go to Palestine and join my grandparents. So they kind of prepared me as a child already done. So you d do you remember how was in your family um, a Shabbos, a Yom Tov? Observe to the hills. Observe Yom Tov and Shabbos. We, you know, we used to have I remember my grandmother used to load up a truck with matzahs to go to her 10 or 11 children and distribute it to all the married ones, you know, bring it for young to for them. And then came the Seder, her house was full of her children and very festive affair. And uh, we were looking forward to it. Especially when time to get off a common, the children found it, or got rewarded for it, nice piece of candy, or whatever, whatever there was. And what about sukkahs? <clears throat> there was a sukkah and on in the house. <clears throat> My grandparents owned the building, which had, I believe, a forty some odd uh, tenants in there. You know, with a uh, yard, a courtyard, and right there there was a soccer. And we children were the ones uh, decorating it. I remember we took flour and water, and that was the glue that would make paper chains to hang up on in the soccer. Yeah. <clears throat> As a child, as you grew up in Warsaw, with Polish neighbors, did you feel anti-Semitism or you had a good life with the neighbors? My dear friend, I come from a virulent anti-Semitic country, Poland, okay? There were some people, and there were 33 million people of the Polish, in the Polish country, country of Poland, and I'm not saying that 100% were there, but the great majority did not like us. I was constantly reminded that they drew good to Palestine. That's, that was there. They came out in the, their mother's womb already as anti-Semites. 
were you ever like attacked by uh, Polish children or harassed? Or harassed, yes. Attacked, no, because I, after all, when the war started, I was 10. And I lived with them as a child, you know, all friends, and, uh, et cetera. And they lived in my grandparents' building that we lived also in. And, uh, but, uh, infants as children you know, were not physically uh, burdened. However, the older ones, the grown-ups, already in a big problem. They with the uh, anti-Semitic uh, decrees. There was a decree about slaughter in skate up and the wife of the uh, uh, one of the senators, complete anti-Semite. She thought it, that the Jews should not slaughter so many. So there were songs about eating a luxury case and all that, not me, because uh, there were restrictions on the uh, on kosher. Were there a lot of... Um... Hasidic Jews living in Warsaw? Oh, yes, the majority were. The majority were, right. And of course, their language uh, was uh, mixed well, because of the capital city. But once you go, went to a shtetl somewhere, it was Yiddish 100%. In Warsaw, uh, my sister and I. Uh, we were probably we had problems with the Yiddish language. My parents had a, a secret. They spoke Yiddish, and we were not aware of all that, you know. But then we were kids, children. So <clears throat> for just a, a few minutes, let's hear your Yiddish language. Hashtag Mama Lushen. And <laughs> But I understand that as a child, I was not understood as a child. And now, when God said, I read Yiddish, I understand all the Russian. So the Yiddish was the first time that you learned in the lager? Yes, as a child, I was in the lager, yes. Yeah. And why do you think you know the language until now? It was very special. My friends are American, they see in this can, they know what I can, but that is Kaidish, so it's my revolution, which you can. No, but it's a kitafel at Hawaii, but my great episode of my revolution is three kimmen, yet, with God's self, can I read, for stay a sachmer and an elder and kimperons. That's how I get the Yiddish. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, it's. So I can have a bit of a laugh now and let's keep singing blim in my cup. Do you remember the address of your house where you lived? Absolutely. It was Konarskego. The street is Konarskego, number five. So as you mentioned before, in the apartment building that your parents owned and your grandparents yes. lived, Jews and non-Jews. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm assuming that with your neighbors, you got along well and... Oh, not, you know, we played with the kids and, uh, you know, a lot of the people who lived in the house were uh, employed by my parents, by my dad. Uh, and uh, we were Jews, believe me. We weren't Jews. I remember my father, may he rest in peace, all of a shalom. There was a man who came in from a shtetl, came into Warsaw, with his wife who was very much expecting a baby. 
and it came a time of Yomtev that this man could not go to Shul because he did not have a, a suit to wear and proper clothes. So I remember my father all over Shul bringing them into my house to our opening the closet, telling them in. Take what you want so you can go and guide them. And this is a remember it sticks in my life. My folks are charged. But to go. I'm, I'm assuming that he had a good pranasa and he was also sharing his... Um... Absolutely. Absolutely. It was not um, just for myself. It was not a selfish motive. We were Jews at heart. We shared that. Uh, I said, Tzedakah uh, was given. And I remember the Karen Kayam at Pushkit and the house. There's always changed clothing in there. Yes, those the little things that do you Do you remember any other special charitable work that your father did in Warsaw? Enough to say that they kept up a stebel. You know, that already involves a garbage and the rent and then men. Uh, so I feel, and of course, there are a lot of things I did not know about as a child. But uh, let me say that uh, I was proud of my parents that they, they have done, and my mom too. And I understood. It was a good life. What was the name of the Stiebel? Would you remember? No, no, I do not. I do not. I remember the address, but I don't know the name of it. So, life was good in Warsaw? For us, yes. There are a lot of poverty in Warsaw. A lot of people that uh, the industry was shoemakers, tailors, you know, nothing substantial. And then the other end of this was lawyers and doctors, of course, accountants. And uh, but they were, a lot of them were assimilated, you know. But the Jewish people, the down to earth people, the Jews, they scratched a daily living with non-essential work that, you know, a shoemaker, or how much, you know, but they all observed the Shabbat. Everybody ran to the baker with the cholent Friday night, Saturday morning they came out and they mixed it up, the rich people's cholent, the poor people's cholent, I remember we used to say we used to have a, a maid, a uh, little due respect to Sheik said that we had. We used to go uh, Sunday morning to the baker, and now uh, the wine, and they had little tanks that one they stood up on a pot, and the second one you got to receive it. But they were mixed up because with the heat of all night, that came off, so it's all right. There's no starvation. Any kosher supermarkets? Oh, sure, sure. Sure, where are they? Uh, I don't know if you know the name of Yatke, what that is. Yatke is the butcher shop. And the Katsev uh, was out there. And also, we went to the market and had the uh, man that slaughtered the uh, chickens. Uh, so when I used to go with my grandmother to a market and they brought them from them and they used to bring in chickens, poultry, all that. So we brought it, brought it to the Shaykhat and the spot there and uh, we came to the chicken to be cooked as shabbats. Now what about beef? How often did you have behind flesh? You know, I admire the ingenuity of the women of a household, of the household. 
and managed to give us, I mean, in my household, wonderful meals. My mom, uh, was a very good cook and chef. I never had uh, any problems with that, but I imagine some families that were less uh, affluent than others had a problem. Yeah, a lot of hungry people also. Now, as a child, it was not like today. The amount of toys and tchotchkes that children have, what were the toys or what were the games that you were playing when you came home from school? You know, you are living in a community at this moment as we speak, of people who can go into a store and buy themselves We'll imagine, and it could be purchased. Now, this did not happen in Warsaw. No. Uh, and there were, we, are, we were fortunate enough to get a little bit more toys than the next person. But basically, as a child, when we do, we kind of uh, make some stockings, make a ball, and kick it, and, and play soccer, and, uh, you know, that was our life. Today, you go out, you buy a football, whatever it is you call it, and you kick. It's not the same. It's a different environment, different world. This is affluent. The countries that uh, are in the Europe didn't have this uh, uh, pleasure. I remember when I was a child, I once, I was a very, very young child, I received from my parents a fire truck, a battery operator's fire truck, and it had, it made, you know, the alarm, the siren, and the lights were flashing. And my father looked at it and said, if I would have had this when I was a child, the entire city would have come together <laughs> to see and look at it. Today, you go into a house station and you get these trucks every year, they have something different. Different world, you know, it's different. So, I don't know how you lived in Hungary, what the progression between Poland and Hungary was. I have no idea, but uh, I imagine that every parent was anxious to see that their child has whatever they didn't have. This is the basis of our living that we're trying to always for our children to have a better life than, than we remember it. And I'm not speaking about uh, uh, the situation, the Holocaust, but the normal life that is exercised in the United States. I you know, my biggest pride at this moment as we speak is that my granddaughter uh, this year got into a medical school and uh, I'm very proud of it. I will be able, God willing, if I'm alive, four years of school, two years of uh, orientation, whatever it is, I could say my king. Uh, um, and this is what we live by. Remember, we're out in the Haltone and we call all in with the chosen people. Chosen people. I remember women were crying always when they went to show and they said the words were all that lahainu lahaj ziknoi. Kirthless kohainu al kazwainu. This I remember. Just forsake us not and we all just give us strength to carry on. And women were always crying at that passage. I remember my father in shoe covered me with the towels, took it under him. I was a child, but these things stick to the mind. It makes us who we are. Makes us who we are. We are Jews, and thank God that uh, as, as much as we suffer, we're still united. After that,
So all this we heard of your life as a child before the Tsaras began. Now, how old were you when all this changed? Ten. So describe to us what happened. It all started with the Dalsam, September the 1st of 1939. And who was the, the first victim was the capital city in Warsaw that we led. It was bombed without mercy by the Germans. They attacked Poland, you know. Before that, there was a question with Czechoslovakia, with the Anschluss and all those things. But we were removed from it. All of a sudden, they attacking the country. So upon the urging of our Polish government, they advised us to evacuate the city. And being that we were on transportation, we took a horse and wagon, couldn't take a truck, there was no gasoline, it was confiscated by the army. And we became instant refugees. And the government advised us to go eastward from Warsaw towards the uh, Russian border. So I want you to know that we traveled strictly at night because anything that moved in the daytime was shot at by the German uh, air force. They were very efficient. And the daytime we would hide in forests came in the dark already when they stopped flying we continued and eventually we stopped in a uh, polish part of the ukraine we not far to the southern to the border and we were received there by the people of that still the dolph or the shtekel and the jewish people we were really uh, they called Bergenses, meaning translating, it means refugees. And they provided for us, they gave us a room to live, and they make sure that we have enough food. And my family was attacked there my mom, my dad, my sister, and I, one of the members. And we stayed there. I don't know if you are aware as to what the climate in Poland is. It's extremely cold, especially in the year between 39 and 40. So, but people passing through that small town brought regards for Warsaw. Yes, there is an occupation, the Germans occupy, but they don't bother anybody. Everybody had the German of the First World War and mind when they were more or less settled. Did they love us then? I don't think so, but... So my then decided to go back. But it was not a simple matter, because Poland has been divided. The Eastern part was given to the Soviet Union. The Western part to Germany. There was a border. So in order for us to go back to Warsaw, we had to smuggle the border. All and behold, my dad found a guide, and we were caught. So we were put by the Russians, and they put us in a makeshift jail about three uh, days, and then they took my father out. They took him away from us. And so that night, I was not to see my father in 22 years. My father was sentenced by the Russians to Siberia. He survived the war. But after the war, somehow Raleigh found out through the United States that my father is alive. They permitted him from Russia to go back to Poland. So I did not really sit across the way from him, I did not see him, but I was in communications with him. And I didn't see him in 22 years in person to come. I already was married to the uh, child, wife and child, and uh, it was time to bring my father over here to get reunited with his son, daughter-in-law, and 
and the first the eine Kolja. So this was when your father decided to go back to Warsaw, right? To go back to Warsaw. Then before we were caught, yeah. Then you were caught and he was taken away from you. Yes, yes. And you remained with your... Mom and sister, right. So then you continued on your journey? I continued on. I took a train, you know, from the border city into Warsaw. I think it was like 250 kilometers, something like that. And right there, we encountered the first act of anti-Semitism. Why? Train cars. Dedicated specifically for Jews only. And I'll show you how our undeveloped mind of a child works. That's me. Saying to myself, hey, have our own railroad. How much better does it get? And that's what the stupidity of youth. And then, of course, we got into Warsaw. The family was very <clears throat> happy to see us. We called them into our apartment that's occupied by strangers. So with persuasion, they permitted us to have one of our rooms. It was. Now, from there on, you know, in the fall of 1940, the real problem started the creation of a ghetto. They designated an area that would hold maybe 125,000 people. But by cleansing the small shtetls around Warsaw and an influx of German Jewish refugees to Warsaw, it swelled to almost a half a million. Tremendous problem, primarily starvation, lack of clothes, and uh, a very rampant disease of typhus, which is extremely uh, life-threatening. So you saw people really dying in the streets. You saw mothers cradling infants. That was not, they were not alive anymore. They didn't want to part with them. People with yellow bellies from starvation, puffed up faces. And people who died, you know, we threw them in the garden in the morning, a man drawn cart, were going, collecting the uh, bodies onto the wagon, into the mass grave, and onto the cemetery. And, uh, you know, sometimes when somebody died of natural uh, causes, and they had no money to bury him. They took the body and threw it in the gutter to be picked up. And that was the beginning of our problem. And every day, different rules. First of all, they took away our radios, took away our fur coats, our jewelry, took away jobs that you and Jews were not supposed to work with. And, and then... They give you uh, food rations if you work. You are entitled to 183 calories per day. In today's terms, slice of bread with something smeared, and this is it. I was supposed to keep you alive with all the sorrows, and I don't know what I wanted it was. And of course, that was the progression of the ghetto. Uh, people dying to Germans, they had a favorite uh, uh, game to run through the ghetto on a motorcycle with mounted you know, machine guns, shoot indiscriminately. No one told us for whoever they were hit to be a Jewish person. And uh, there was a lot, there were a lot of problems. And then somewhere in 1942, they decided to diminish the size of the ghetto by, uh, first of all, they were masters of deception. Now the true word came out of them. So they put out that they're going to take out people from the ghetto, send them to beautiful places and going to get the jobs and food and 
families who have got the kids go to school, cultural, and people gullibly went on these transports. They demanded 6,000 per day of our elders. And I followed the head of the uh, Jewish uh, show was by the name of Chernyakov, Adam Chernyakov. He committed suicide rather than telling and committing himself to 6,000 of Jews. He knew already what it was. And most of the Jews of Warsaw went to Treblinka. And Treblinka was an outright slaughterhouse. I remember there were thousands of concentration camps, but there were only six designated specifically for murdering of the Jews. Shemlinka was the ones that people from Warsaw were transit. I was almost towards the very end of the ghetto, and I was transferred to my mom and sister to my direct. And we came in there, selections, you know, and then they separated men from women. And this was the last time I did see my mother and sister alive. My mom was 34. My sister, I believe, was 12 years old. And um, that was it. From there on, my journey began. And now, uh, my Danik, it was hell on earth. To spend the day there equaled a lifetime outside of the world. And uh, then I was lucky enough that they sold the SS, the German SS, sold 3,000 of us to an ammunition factory called Hassan. And we were transferred from Majdanek into another camp in Skarzysko. When I left, there were close to 18,000 Jews in Majdanek. November 3, 1943, uh, they devised a code name of Earl Pet Fast. That means Harvest Festival. And this was the worst day in the history of the Holocaust. Because there were a lot of industries around Majdanek and they transferred to Warsaw, the machinery and people and all that. And the result was that 43,000 people were murdered on that day. November 3. And then on Wikipedia, you can find that. What year? 1943. And uh, not leaving a Jew alive there. We were protected because we were very essential for my manufacturing missiles and bullets and all. And I stayed in this Kajisco for over a year. And from there, they joined me as the Allies were approaching. They transferred us to Germany, to the heart of Germany in Buchenwald, another famous concentration. Where I got this jacket and little slacks to it and shoes like you see here. And uh, we continued with this factory that the Hussar being that we already were experienced uh, militia workers. They sent us to the sub-camp manufacturing bazookas. And that camp was Schlieben. I don't know if it's marked there. And from Schlieben, we stayed until the Allies started to come to, the, to Europe already. But we were not aware at all as to what goes on outside the world. 
one beautiful afternoon, they evacuated my camp, taking us on a death march. And what is the death march? Precisely, it's what it says. If you could not keep up with it, they summarily put you aside. You know, um, many times in reminiscing, I'm comparing life in the United States versus what we were subjected to. If somebody commits a crime here, a very violent crime, and is sentenced to die, they color every venue, every avenue, to make sure that an innocent life is not taken. It can take years. Finally, they decide that you're guilty, they continue it. But if there's the slightest doubt, they're not going to murder you. That did not happen there. As soon as they could, as fast as they could pass, pull a trigger, your life was ended. You know, we marched until primarily when we did, we dug and they tank ditches. With the Russian tanks, they will only get stuck in there. Nonsense, but only they will long right through. And I remember one night they put us up, they put us up in the school, and the morning we get up, there was a tank standing right in front of that school. And I said to myself, oh, this is the end. They probably want to do away with us, to uh, cover up their atrocities, etc. But the turret opens up and out comes a Russian officer. And that was the uh, really my the day of my birth. It was May the eighth of nineteen forty five. And of course it was the Polish army under the Russian rule. And Pesamites. Telling us how come that you survived, you know, the Jews know. Thank God they had Jewish officers there in that army. And from there on, you know, we started to look for family. Unfortunately, I had 126 people in my family in that war. I don't say perish, they were murdered and trolled. Explain, please, um, the 126. How how were they family? Well, my parent, my and uh, paternal grandparents had seven children. Maternal had ten, and most of all were married. And there were cousins, second cousins. A lot of them I did not know. You married the second cousin, third cousins. I didn't know I was a child after all. And, but they were family in one moment. Not one of them survived. So I would like to go back to a very interesting part of your Holocaust experience. Is going back to the Warsaw Ghetto. Okay. The house that you lived in, your parents' house, your grandparents' house, was that part of the ghetto? No. So you had to move well, into... To move. We were fortunate enough to trade it with somebody who lived on the other part. And you would like, uh, you given up a palace against the chicken coop. But it was a roof over our heads. And you know, the time of the year it was getting cold and rainy, we were happy to get what we had. So you were mentioning before how people unfortunately died of illnesses during the Holocaust and they were taken to be buried. As a young child, what did that do to you, seeing people dying on the street? You know, I think it become hard until when I... I, I don't know how you possibly can stand it. But you live under the circumstances, really. you just have to take as to what is true match. Because you're not a master of your own self, of your own future, of your own thing. You just simply, whatever 
is thrown at you, that's it. But you have to accept it. Take it and leave it. You're sentenced to die anyway. Because the thing was for them to, to have a, a, a true genocide, to do away with every Jew on the face of the earth. But as I mentioned before, in the five over 5,000 years of our history, we managed to survive. I can tell you what happened in the 14th century in Spain, the Inquisition. So the king, Ferdinand, Queen Elizabeth, issued a decree that everyone in the country has to convert to Christianity. If not, we're going to burn you at stake. But a choice was given. You could have really change and stay alive. That's why we have a lot of people who presumably change their religion but contribute to rituals. We cannot destroy our religion. We are here. We are God-given. We are God-given people. So if I'm here or on, on, uh, on dead or so, my ancestors are going to do it for me because I am a chosen person. So in the Warsaw Ghetto, it was you, your sister, and your mother. Yes, and then my birth of the family. Who else from your family was there? Aunts and uncles. Yeah. But eventually, they were taken away, sent to Trublin. And that was the end. So when were they taking away, when were they deporting people from the it ghettos? The uh, spring of 1942. That's okay. where they were deporting people from yeah. the ghetto. Yeah. The settlement, they called it. Did you know where they were taking these people? At the beginning, no, until they started to follow them. And, of course, trains were full going and coming back empty. So people started to follow them with tales of horror. That people are being killed by gassing, by shooting, by electrocuting by cremating, and nobody wanted to believe in the ghetto that the Germans, the cultural people, are capable of this, these atrocities. But yet they were factual. So how? Let's figure out how did the people in the ghetto figure out what was happening to the Jews that are being deported? Well, they will follow them. And people came in, we had people living on the Aryan side, you know, and there was communication. And then a young man by the name of Mordechai Adelimich was the one that says that he ain't you know, going to resist. And hence the uh, uprising in Warsaw. You know, they took students, 15, 16 years old, Molotov cocktails made at home. Uh, they purchased, so nobody gave them. They had to purchase the, the few guns and each bullet. Every bullet that they had there had to serve a purpose. It was not wasted. And, uh, you know, it took the Germans maybe three weeks to, like, to really occupy the whole country of Poland, a normal Poland. Yet it was almost six weeks that the Holocaust lasted. The uh, uprising lasted. Yeah. And finally, uh, the general that was in charge of destruction sent out the uh, email to Hitler. The Jewish quarters is no more. No more Jewish wars. The last thing we did is dynamite it on the largest synagogue in Europe, on Tomatska State in Wars, was the end of it. And I did of course, I was in my daughter already. 
So, but you were there when the uprising started. I was in Warsaw when that started. Right. Sure. Absolutely. So what did you witness during the uprising? Well, the young people going there with guns, they, went, they basically went of Kedosh Hashem. Because you could not win. You were fighting the army. It was the time when they were occupying the whole Europe. They were weak or two, they occupied countries. And here come the few remnants, the Jews, that hated them and they hate each other. You know, the, the Germans. And suddenly they stepped up to it. That was the most heroic act because they knew that they are gonna, they're not gonna call a lie. Some of them did survive. Through the sewer system of Warsaw and all that. And uh, it's all, you know, People ask me, how did I survive? I sure, nothing else. I was not stronger, nor was I smarter than the next person. No, at all. I was a child. Yet they did not make it. They were much stronger than I with in any face. They did not. And I, with the grace of God, here I am. So when you read or you watch the films, you see the people, the Jewish people in the uprising, how they were shooting, how they were throwing these Molotov cocktails, and how the the Nazis were fighting back. Where were you at that time, and did you see any of these? I saw, I witnessed every act until May the 3rd of 1943, and it started April the 19th. So I was like three weeks into the uprising. And I, I saw them shooting, I saw cocktails, the moment of cocktails, I witnessed all. Did you see SS men getting killed? Not personally, but I watched them on the computer, on the television, I did see it. But we had proven that Jews do not go like sheep to a slaughter. And out of all this here, the Hashem was gracious enough to give us the state of Israel. It came on the ashes of the Holocaust. And we must see to it that this country stays strong. Of course, how many times was I told as a child Jew go to Palestine? You know, Palestine, thank God for what it is. Nobody can touch us. We have a country. Nobody wanted us to accept us or anything. Look at the St. Louis here. What happens? The ship is here, ready for freedom. Send them back. What? They knew they're going to die. Yet they did it because they said presumably not, but I consider it an anti-Semitic art. Now, during this time when this was all going on, what did your mother tell you? What's happening? What did what was the discussions between your mother and you? Okay, let me tell you. First of all, I was separated from my mother and then learned what she did. Only at the very end, when my place of work was liquidated, did I, and did I hide and her place that was temporarily safe. They were making parts for uh, airplanes um, for a new name. That was in Warsaw? In Warsaw, yeah. And, uh, just remember that I was not a child ever. I was a boy and a man. So, well, then I, I grew up very, very quick. Not only I, but people in my position. We, uh, we were not children. Childhood was stolen from us. So we are who we are. Not 
and probably smarter than I expect they are. We probably are in a position to bestow guidance unto others. Watch yourself because history is capable of repetition and it can happen today to us. And you know, tomorrow is for the Buddhists and then when and uh any organized religion is vulnerable to be persecuted and if you do not watch yourself. And the basic of all of this is hatred. Do away with hatred and you're gonna have utopia, you're gonna have a wonderful is right to learn. The that two, is why I run around to schools and speak my heart out against hatred. Against hatred. So now in Warsaw during the ghetto, you were like separated from your mom. You said. Yes. Did you have any communication with her? Did she know where you are, or did you know where she is? Sometimes, you know, at night when I was peace, more or less peaceful, when the action did not take place, I would sneak over to her place where she lives, you know, to just say hello. She worked in a different uh, factory than I did, different job than I did. So you worked, basically, during oh, the course of ghetto. So how long were you in the Warsaw Ghetto? It started in the fall of 40, till May, uh, beginning of May of 43. So I went there for three years. Now what did you wear? The Star of David or the armband? Armband. You heard the Star of David. Every Jew in the in, uh, Warsaw had to wear Start of it. Now, wasn't the ghetto just for Jews? Yes. So why would you have to be um, identified with an armband? It's an arm. It's an act of shamefulness. I could not, if you were caught without it, and people were executed for it. You could not deny the fact that you're a Jew. So what you're saying is, was there torture, punishment, or killing? Guns still as long as the occupation of Germans there. The, munch, the things you mentioned now weren't practiced. Explain. Well, life was meaningless. They did all kinds of cruel acts against humanity. Beating, hanging, shooting, cremating, guessing, all that happened. Yes, but the question is in Warsaw, in the ghetto. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Any particular people, famous people, or rabbis, or rabbis, or rabbanim in the ghetto? Do you remember names of who was there? Uh, Frank Pino. You know why? Because I was a child. I was not connected with any of that. And I know some would happen with the Mary Shiva that the whole Shiva will rescue. You know, through Lithuania, they went to Japan, and they came here, and they were alike. And they never knew any one of them, but the fact is that there was still a little bit of humanity shown. So, a Shabbos in the ghetto, you went to synagogue or something like no, that? No, I think you had a it was a seven day of the week, six day of the week. Nothing. And you pick chairs, they sit at a Sabbath dinner, forget it. It wasn't a dream. Well, no, I, I didn't even know the day. Shabbos, Sunday, Monday, yeah. I'm alive, that's it. So, 
So the day came that you were deported from Warsaw. Yeah. What date was that? I'm telling you, May the 3rd of 1943. Was that after the uprising? During. During the uprising? Yes. Okay, so who was taken, and where were you taken, and how were you taken? Well, I was with my mom then, and her place of work was liquidated, marching us down to the railroad station, the Umschlagplatz, into the wagon, transportation into destination not known, warmed up by Dalek. So it's a, from a fire into a frying pan, that was it. So explain the means of transportation. Into a freight car, 120. Prior to a boarding, they, are, they sprinkled it with the chlorine to prevent the spread of a disease the time they were always afraid. Um, Normally, a journey like this would take by bus, and when I came back after the war, it took four hours by bus, or war so to went down there. It took us three days in the car. Why? Prior transport to us were not eliminated. So then our, our turn came. That was it. We learned it in a place in a city called Lublin. They had the uh, big Yoshima in Lublin. You know, they had this uh, uh, page a day. After learn the page of Torah a day. Dafiomi. Dafiomi, yes. And, uh, and then, so we were in Lublin. And from there, we had to go by foot to the camp of my dad. I think in three, four kilometers, something like that. And then it became an invisible selection. They were seeing people with hunchbacks and all gray hair, big glasses. They took them away right away. Put them in lorries, never to be seen again. Then came... In the daytime, in the morning, all hell broke loose. Selection. So, you had to, first of all, they uh, separated men from women, and then you have to go by a German officer, left to right, left to right, life or death. This is, as I mentioned before, my last time I did see my sister, mother and sister alive. Did you get a chance to say goodbye? No. Never had the luxury. So how were you separated from your mom and sister? Oh, well, separated in line for women. That was it. And I was lucky that I was tall for my age. And they permitted me to live. Now going back to that transportation, the three days in the wagons... Was that what we call today the cattle cars? Yeah. Room food, four horses and eight people, something like that, 120. So how was that journey? 12 people suffocated. I will tell you. You have no room where to sit, stand, crouch, and most of all, there's no air. Because they put barbed wire on that little opening, and that was it. Yeah, it was a journey of horror. I imagine different cars had different victims. So you arrived in Majdanek. So we hear that Majdanek was a horrible camp. Absolutely. So tell us about that camp in Majdanek. Well, first of all, the... Inhumanity. People stop being humane. They really, you will not be a human being anymore. 
anything that could be done against you normalizing a life was exercised there. And always at the cost of losing your life. Very extreme. Because life had absolutely no meaning. No meaning at all. You watch people hang him. You watch people, well, first of all, three times a day they counted us in fear that maybe somebody ran away. Physically impossible. Of course, you had electrified wiring there. You got the mines around there. And patrols with dogs, you know, watchtowers. And also, I must tell you that uh, it was not only done by Germans. They were collaborators. I remember a lot of Ukrainian guards and the angry face that Jews were killed. They had the to do that. I don't know, you know, you cannot uh, really persecute a uh, child with the father's uh, sense. But this was the situation we have as, as we speak. But what I am mixed emotion as to what is happening there now. I don't want to express it because they probably hang me on the highest tree. But when they were going through there, we went through before. Committed maybe by the some people, maybe not. That's why Clap Bomb. So going back to life, to daily life in Maidanek, give us more what happened in Maidanek. What was the daily, your daily experiences in that camp? First of all, you got up at 3 o'clock in the morning and they gave you coffee, so to speak. What was it? Burnt wheat with hot water. Then you went and they got a uh, pile, which is a, a roll call, five a burst and all. And they meted out all the uh, transgressions that you had during the day. They put your number down, and then you were subject of being hurt physically. They put you over a ball and a two by four and did that, and also. The attitude of prisoners versus the prisoners. There were prisoners like us, but they had a band, they were couples, and they were the worst criminals in creation, worse than the generals. And they were prisoners like we were. And to live through a day was living a lifetime and under my old circumstances. Yeah, you know, uh, there was a, you started, I think, at maybe 9 or 10 at night. The red light was out. You couldn't step out of the bar. Or they designated for 120 people. 400 stopped. They stopped on barracks three high. And, and when they were giving out the banks, everybody was lying to go on a higher road. Monk, where are you? There was no food. We were eating grass. And due to that, you got dysentery and diarrhea. And you slept as slots. The stuff was trickling down. This is what happened. That was my dummy. And with all that here, the luxury was to live through the day. Almost impossible. They give you blankets, you wouldn't dare cover yourself because there were lice affected and lice were the carriers of typhus. They bit you, you got typhus, that's it. Once you got into a hospital, to the beer, 
aber kein Markt. So in short, why does Maidanek have the title of a very horrible camp? Because uh, of the um, people who took care of the, uh, the drunk ones being in charge of it, of the cruelty of theirs, and wrote the special schools how to deal with Jews. The Maidanek was one of them that they exercised cruelty, men and women. What cruelty was exercised in Maidanek? Oh my God. Everything that, everything that you could think of as no was given to us. Everything. Beating, maiming, murdering, hanging, gassing, shooting. Name it, life was second. I appear, let me see if I can find it. I must find something for me. So now in Maidanek, you mentioned one day was the worst day of the Holocaust. I what was day was not it? there. I was taken out several weeks ago on the Maidanek to, I was sold to this factory, ammunition factory. And the name of it was the Hasag, H-A-S-A-G which was what, the one the third largest ammunition factory on the, uh, the German Reich. And this probably most likely saved my life by being there, but we were working with ammunition and all that. So give us the details and the date of that worst day of the Holocaust. Well, in November the 3rd of 1943. I will show you. What was there? Explain us. Well, they took all the Jews from around to the surrounding uh, area there. First of all, I think there were four or five camps. And the total amount of people were 43,000. And they killed them. They murdered them in one day. And this was called Earned the Fast Harvest Festival. And it was going to the worst day, and people are not aware of it. They want to print. So, you already told us about you went to Buchenwald, Schleiben, and then the Death March. Yeah. Then the Death March. And after the Death March, you were liberated. So, what happened after liberation? Well, I was liberated in a Czech, uh, that in Czechoslovakia, the annexed uh, places in Sudetenland, you know. And it was right near the German border of Czechoslovakia and Germany. And I was liberated by the Russian. I am multilingual, so I found the job as an interpreter for the Russians. Uh, what were they doing there? There was a paper factory in that town. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw or heard about the paper machine. It's as big as a city lawn. One day it goes mush, and then paper rolls out. And this, this factory was fairly good because I think and five or six machines like that. And their own forests, their own... Uh, the sawmills and all that. And the Russians came in and took them back to Russia. So now I worked with them to interpret from German to Russian. And I was there a whole year with them. And pictures and all kinds of stuff for them. Where was that? In Germany. 
right over the border on the border of Czechoslovakia. Okay, and from there on, after you were a free man, the war was over. Where did you go? First of all, I went to Prague in Czechoslovakia to find out if there are any uh, members of my family who left because there were a lot of people who came. Unfortunately, I did not find anyone. So I went back there and I spent the whole year with the Russians. And it treated me very good, you know. And then it was time to leave. So I took a military train to Berlin in Germany and went to the first DP, displaced persons camp. And that was in Schwachtensee in the Germany, in Berlin. And from there on, I went to a kibbutz. Young people, the Sayalin from the British Army came and they took off their uniforms and they were recruiting young people to go with the Aliyah battle, you know, to go to Palestine, to Israel then. And uh, there was a kibbutz and I, I was in them. I a lot of uh, stuff to, from the kibbutz here, you know, the pictures, and all that. And from there, I put in an ad in a in a inter DP camps asking for an uncle who came to the United States in the war. But this Bashir, my aunt, he was married to an American woman. Her cousin here saw this ad and gave me my uncle's address. So the reason I came to the United States was uh, my uncle came to the United States with my cousin, with his son, Mark, who enlisted in the U.S. Army, and he was killed in Anglia and Italy as an American soldier. But I wanted to avoid to be with them to ease their pain here to my uncle, and I changed my mind about going well, to Israel, and I came to the States. My entire kibbutz was on Exodus, on that ship. I had a lot of friends there. And I have some family, second cousin all in Israel now. So, so some family members did survive. There was others. And now let's survive they, there. They lived in Israel, in Palestine before the yeah, war. Yeah, yeah. The person my grandparents, I picked the three kids with them. And... Did you ever go back after the war? Did you ever go back to your hometown, Warsaw? I went three times on the march of the living. But I never went to the street that I lived down. No, well, my question is, is after the war, did you try going back to see what you can find in Warsaw? Never. Because I was aware that there was nothing left there. What about your parents' house? I don't even know if it stands. Because Warsaw was on the bombardment, and then and, and, and there, there was a Polish uh, uprising, and they. Uh, it was a mess. I didn't know the house that stands. I don't know. So, the striped jacket, which is now hanging behind you, that was given to you in my daddy. No, in Buffalo Valley. Not in my daddy. Okay. my daddy, we, we live, we wore civilian clothes, but they put enamel, you know, they brush down enamel to it to signify you as a prisoner. All your civilian clothes? Civilian, not mine, because we came in, we got very naked after the showers. And they were, you know, they put enamel on us and 
Okay, so you got that uniform in Buchenwald. Yes. And 44. And 44. How did that uniform with you survive till today? You know, I feel that this uniform is a survivor as well as I am. And I kind of, first of all, the Czechs were very nice to us after the war. The Panthers and all. I wore this, I could go on any train I wanted. They were no charge, nothing. And I kind of kept, kept this with me. Maybe that's my, I don't know, but I've got it. Not many survivors have their that's uniform. True. People want to try to get rid of it. I did not. I chose to keep it. And right now, as I said, it's destined to go to the museum. I'm on the board of directors there, and I promised them that this is going to go to them. Our chances of giving it to just about anybody that's got another armor and leg. Shop. So I see there's a patch on the jacket that has not a original. number. Original. They're not original because they disintegrated with the time. So I had to buy a few pieces of felt, make the Star of David and the number that I remember. Right, so what was your number on the uniform? 68616 in Bohoval. My Danik, I don't remember. So I guess this was your clothing as you went on the death march with this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This and a pair of slugs like this, which I that what will happen. So everybody has what you call a peckle. So as I know that you've been interviewed many times and you speak to audiences in schools many times, what is the average time, let's say, if you would speak to a school? What was the average time? How long would it take? Sometimes an hour, sometimes we got two classes for two hours, and it depends. I'm written up in a lot of newspapers, the Jewish papers. I get a whole bunch of them here. And uh, I think when it comes to the Holocaust that is mandated in the state now, I just want to show you something what I received. You see, there's a telling me that purple. Yes. Yeah. Take a look at it. That is. Take a look. Color is freedom award. Yeah, I see. Oh, I see this. I'm from the old governor. Yes. The new Ooh. one. Take a look up there. What this picture is. See where the picture is there? With the center? On the wall. Yeah. Yes, that one. Yeah. Read it. <laughs> yes, that's the, yes, I see. It's just very recent that I got that. Yes, in April 7th. Yeah. So what is the message being that we will try to publish your story to you know, to bring it out there, people to read, I people to hear. be outstanding. You know, I am a survivor of the worst tragedy. And for the grace of God, I'm here. People ask me, how did I survive? People much stronger than I, and they had anything above me, never made it. And I, 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 I attribute that to a word called Bashir. But I was also, it's been shared for me for a purpose. A big sign I will speak for those who cannot speak. 
And this is my motto. This is what I go by. That's why I go to so many schools. And you know what schools I like to go to? Left. And Boca Raton, Del Rey, Boyton. Because the Jewish people, somewhere invariably, the Holocaust is going to come on a table we're going to talk about. But. He goes to Pahoki, he goes to Belgrade, all talking like Okeechobee, uh, and all places when they never saw a Jew in their lives. With those, I sit with the students and I explain to them what was done to our people. And if you don't watch it, it's going to happen to you. This is what I go to primarily. Today I went to the Dreyfus School. It's a magnet school, which is, and uh, I would say 85% were not Jewish. The questions they ask, they're going to write to me. And I mentioned to them, listen, remember, I know a lot about the Holocaust, but not everything. So whatever I know, I'll share with you. So what would what would your message be to the future generation? The first thing my message to them is to get rid of the world hate. And secondly, to start to start to understand what the other side looks like. Remember, we are all created, we are all creations of God. To me, it's one God, my God. And I believe in him. I'm willing to sacrifice my life for him. And show some feelings for humanity. If you're going to be Elaine, there's going to be wishes will be answered while we are not. At this time, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to meet you. Thank you. And to interview you and to get your story. You see, I, as I mentioned to you, I frown upon people who are making financial games out of it. To me, it was my brother and were killed. My brothers, my sisters, aunts, uncles. My grandparents, aunts, and uncles were killed. You are you? My father is the only survivor of his entire family. Unfortunately, no, I had two aunts who survived. One was in Ravensbrück and one was hidden. And they lived in Paris. Brought the one passed away. So I have three cousins. Uh, actually, two, one passed away. One lives in Israel and one is in, the, in Belgium. And this is my family. Of the world that people were shared, and that's it. So, I have my whole family. I've got, I've got an anxious child here, married 67 years to this lady. And every morning I get up, I say, Why the Baal Hashem? That's all I could say. And all I could say is thank you again for giving me this opportunity. You almost didn't have it. I know. You know why? Because I'm not interested in publicizing. I'm not. So we are. I speak to a school. I know I've got 60, 80, 100 kids. I addressed one, one time in the Fort Lauderdale. There were over a thousand students, and I was the main speaker there. Again, I left them with something. Do not hate. But I know that a hundred emissaries or a thousand emissaries are out there fighting for it. And this is how I go by. I don't, and it's quick. And the for it, never. 
sometimes, you know, I, I remember once I was talking in a show, they're giving me an, an envelope of about $500 for just talking. That money went right to my organization. Use it for what's necessary. I don't want anything because that's blood money. So, and still why it is, my friend. Thank you very much. Get info. Get info.